Hello, my name is Deadeye Rick. I'm one of the historians who focuses on the third system of seacoast fortifications. What I have behind me is one of my favorite of these fortresses. Allow me to introduce to you my favorite place on earth, Fort Rodman, right here in your community. Hello, my name is Paul Zabornak. I'm a member of the uh, Fort Tabor Fort, Fort Rodman Military Museum here in New Bedford, Mass. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the fort that we have here. Here we have a model of Fort Rodman. Uh, back in the 1840s, there was a group of Army engineers up in Boston, and they were studying the East Coast of the United States, looking for places to build fortresses to defend our East Coast. They came down to New Bedford here, and they saw this piece of land down here called, called Clark's Point at the time, and they decided this would be a perfect place to build this, this structure. So they went to the, the mayor at the time, who was Fort Tabor, and the city council. And they presented their ideas about building this fort. So everybody agreed, because after the, Re the Revolutionary War across the bay here, Fort Phoenix in Fairhaven was burned to the ground by the British. So they knew that fort was not strong enough to defend this harbor. So they got permission from the government at a cost of $50,000 to build this fort. So in 1857, the U.S. War Department decided to build a fortress out here, and they sent a team of uh, engineers to survey the site right out here on Clark's Point. They decided that they would build a concentrated, strong works with overwhelming firepower to cover the area, making sure that no unwelcome vessels could enter the waters around the New Bedford area. As you can see by the gun rooms, that the guns were actually very close together, maximizing the effectiveness of their concentrated firepower. With a range of up to three and a half miles, the guns of Fort Rodman could completely cover our waterways, combined with a few other outer works and batteries that could provide a crossfire, preventing any ship that was unwelcome forever entering this area. Now, when they were making a strong work to be bomb-proof, they had to apply certain principles of engineering that you won't find in a normal building. After all, the strong work is designed to sustain a heavy bombardment, and the casement arches and barrel vaults that you are looking at now are designed to do just that. In 1861 comes around, the Civil War breaks out. The fellow who is the architect and the first engineer of this building, he hightails it to Richmond, Virginia, to take control of the Confederate forces. His name is Robert E. Lee. Okay. He, uh, he took control of the Confederate forces. The fort at that time was about half completed. And, uh, and around 1863, 64, somewhere there in that time period, the Confederates wanted to come up here to New Bedford to raid New Bedford for the whale oil. When he heard about this idea, he got his people together and says, don't go up there, you'll never survive a battle. And they says, why not, it'd be easy pickings. He says, no, it's not gonna be easy pickings. I have a fort being built there that I designed and he says, you never survive a battle. It's going to have 70, between 70, 75 Rodman and Parrot rifles up there. He says, so you'll never survive a battle. They'll cut you to pieces. So on his say-so, they never invaded the uh, New England area. So the guns that were mounted in this fortress were very, very large. Most of them were a Model 1861 Rodman Columbia. This particular gun weighed about 15,000 pounds and fired a 125 pound cannonball up to three and a half miles. And they mounted them one right after the other right here in the breezeway. Now the firepower is impressive enough, but when the engineers were deciding on the best way to build this fortress, they had to figure out a way to clear out the smoke and how to cool off the troops. 
So they configured their arches in such a way to not only provide strength for the fortress, but to create a breeze. So that as they're firing their guns, and the guns produce heat that goes up into the barrel, it creates a circulation of air. The circulation up there in the barrel then causes a breeze to whip up down here in the breezeway. The recesses below the casement arches are what help the convection occurring in the barrel from being disrupted by the lateral flow of air down the breezeway. In this way, they can clear the smoke and cool the troops. And the more you fire, the more heat they produce, the greater the wind. Also what it did was above the cannons in their encasements, up in the ceiling there's a, a slot. It's about, it's about four to five inches wide, about three feet long. When they fired these cannons, the smoke had to go somewhere because in those days they didn't have smokeless powder. So the smoke had to go somewhere. Okay, the air going through the fort is funneled to every one of these encasements. So when they fired a cannon, the air would take the smoke, funnel it up through this hole in the ceiling and out. Now you ask, where did, it, where did the smoke go? Robert e. Lee had the idea that if you built stairwells, there's two of them here, and you made chimneys out of them, and you, you could direct the smoke to those chimneys and out. So it works pretty much like your chimney in your house. The air su literally sucks the smoke out. So when they fired a cannon, in about three or four minutes, you could reload that gun and fire it again. We clear that, that quickly. Another purpose for these arches is for the transference of kinetic energy. When a cannonball hits the outside of the building, the power and the force from that impact will actually transfer through these arches. 20% of it is theorized to go straight down into the cistern wells, which are located directly under the walls. In this way, the damage is reduced. But what also happens is that the other 80% of that energy will flow laterally through these walls and casement arches and refract back to its point of origin from the corners of the building. This also was a tremendous innovation of the time. In effect, they created a spring mechanism in the bricks to cause cannonballs to bounce harmlessly off the outside of the wall. Back when the building was brand new, this was a very strong work. But as you can see by the damage in my casement arches, that as water has leaked through the walls, it has settled in and caused a good amount of deposits and calcitration. When this water freezes during the winter time, it expands and causes the bricks to break and the entire building is beginning to crumble as a result. The way to fix this is quite simple. Simply remove all the plants from the rooftop, repair the rooftop, and relay the dirt and the sod like it's supposed to be, and we will minimize, if not stop, this effect from continuing. This is a very, very important program that really should be initiated right away. On top of the fort, we have a couple structures over here. These were supply huts. This is where they kept the supplies for the fort, their uniforms, their food, uh, medical supplies, whatever they needed to sustain the fort. They didn't rely too much on the city to supply them anything. The other building over here, which you see, is where they kept the powder bags. The powder bags were kept up there because in those days there was no such thing as no smoking, so guys would smoke their cigarettes, pipes, uh, cigars, whatever. They didn't want them flicking their ashes in the wrong spot and have a hundred bags of gunpowder go up in flames. So they put it up there. They had a hand crank elevator system that lower the bags down to each gun placement. Okay. They put them on a wagon and they would carry them over to the cannon. The cannonballs were stored at the cannon and they had a special apparatus to pick the balls up to load them into the cannon. The balls are heavy. We have several over here on the, the corner here. The big black one, it takes three of us to pick it up. So you can imagine trying to pick that thing up by yourself to put it inside of a cannon. You're not going to do it. So they had a special tool to pick them up, load the cannon. For a basic anatomy of a standard gun room in one of the third system fortresses goes as such. First, they make their barrel vault. The barrel vault is designed for structural and load-bearing purposes, but they also discovered that it serves perfect for the transference of kinetic energy, and it also helps control airflow. Remember, they're trying to create circulation up in that barrel, 
so the vault has to be symmetrical and perfect so that the airflow and acoustics are all completely controlled. In support of the barrel vault, they put in casement arches. The casement arches open up the breezeway where all of the gun rooms are. In this way, the breezeway isn't all confined, containing the heat and the smoke and the sound. It's all got to be open so that the air can flow and the sound can also flow and dissipate. Now, these were all standard designs for fortresses all over the place. Uh, in fact, these arches, some of them known as Roman arches, date back all the way into Roman times. This is an engineering design that uh, really predates the American civilization altogether. However, the distinctly American aspect of this gun room happens to be the window. This window is called the Totten Embrasure, and it's an invention that came to us from the third graduate ever from West Point Academy, uh, Joseph Gilbert Totten. His field of expertise was theoretical engineering. And one thing he was trying to do in the design of his fortresses is expand the range or the span that his guns can aim, the swing. Uh, so what he did is he improved the angles so that you can get a wider scope of your guns and then he improved the shutter as well. Now, the purpose of the steeper angle is so that you can get your gun to swing at a wider traverse. Traverse is the technical term for the arc that the gun can swing back and forth when aiming. On a normal gun window, the uh, walls would be about here, preventing you from moving that gun too far. As a result, you could only bring some of your guns to bear on a single target. By opening this up more, you can bring all of your guns to bear on a single target. Now, the naysayers were saying that this made a weak point in the exterior of the wall because this angle from about here forward makes all of this too skinny to really support or be strong against incoming fire. So he dealt with that by putting a two inch thick iron shutter on the outside. Now that's kind of obvious, okay just put iron out there and you've got a better window. But now the trick is how that window actually worked. They would load the cannon back here and then they would push it all the way into the window with the shutter closed and the gun would press up against it they would fire the gun with the shutter closed. It would fly open because of all of the air escaping out of the barrel in advance of the projectile would cause that shutter to fly open and the bullet would fly right out. That window would slam shut again because it would open with such force that it would just bounce off the outside frame and slam right shut. So the window was only open in the moment that the cannonball was leaving the window, keeping the gun and the gun crew happily protected behind it. They're charged to be uh, faded by the sunlight so they, they put a, a purple color to the glass. What that did was it filtered out ultraviolet rays from the sun. They knew about that back then. Right? So they could read their charts during the daytime. At nighttime, the moonlight would shine through here and light up the inside and still not give your position away. It would light up the room and you could read your charts. The other building over here, it's just a little garage. That's all it is. And they kept this searchlight inside there. And the idea of that was they, they put the searchlight in there during the daytime so that if anybody's out here as a sniper trying to shoot it out for the fun of it or for whatever reason, they couldn't get to it. So they kept it inside there during the daytime. At nighttime, if they needed it, they'd roll it out here on, the, on these tracks, they light it up, and they could shine out in a harbor looking for enemy ships. So that's why these two buildings are up here. The fort is supposed to be three tiers high, it's only two. Because after the Civil War, the fort became obsolete. With new technology coming out at that time, instead of shooting cannonballs out of a cannon, now they're shooting projectiles with rifled uh, barrels. They have a longer range, more deadlier force. So the fort pretty much became obsolete. So if you walk outside the museum here and around the park, you'll see these large uh, stones outside that are square or rectangle in shape. That is the third tier of the fort that was never built. When you go outside, this is one of the, the bunkers out here, okay? This is the one right across from the fort. The fort is right over here. This is the first one. And then this is, uh, let's see, this is Battery Gadsden, okay? Down here shows the kind of gun that was up there. These were huge, huge guns. They were on a cradle. When they got ready to fire them, they lower them down. They were hydraulically driven. They lower them down to the ground. They would load these shells 
here into it. And when they got ready to fire the gun, they would raise the gun back up over top of the wall and they could fire it. Okay. The idea of that was if you're out there shooting at an enemy ship, you don't you don't you don't want to be shot back at, right? So you raise the gun up over the wall, you fire it. You bring the gun back down below the wall, they can't see you, they can't shoot you. And you, you can, and plus it makes it easier to reload, because if this thing's way up in the air, it's hard to reload. But if you bring it down close to the ground, they have special cradles that they uh, put the shell on that you can reload the gun. So in the, in the military park here, we have, I believe there's five of these. There's two here, and I think there's three on the other side of the park. And then there's a, a big one over there called Battery Millican. That had the biggest gun. And when they fired that, they had to notify the city in advance that they're going to fire this thing because it was so loud that halfway through the city, people had to open their windows. They had to take stuff off the shelves because when they fired this thing, it would break windows. The concussion of it was so, so loud. This is what it used to look like back in oh, the early 1900s. You walk out here, they had a building out here and the ships would come in with their cannonballs or whatever they're gonna have for the fort. The, the colors and the design started with the British flag, the red duster the British flag and as time went on it changed a little bit you see the next flag they added some writing on the Taunton flag that was actually flown in Taunton Massachusetts and then uh, the Grand Union flag then they decided okay we're gonna keep the same colors but let's put stripes on it one for each colony and they kept the Union Jack the British Union Jack because we were still under British rule at the time and then George Washington comes along and he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to do away with that Union Jack. I don't like that. And we're going to put the blue flag up, the blue background with the stars. Each star will represent a new state. They kept the red, white stripes, 13 of them for the 13 original colonies. So we, that's how we kept our stripes. They, they were talking about adding a stripe for each state. But you know how big that flag would be if you added a stripe for each date? It'd be pretty big. So they decided to keep just 13 stripes, red and white, for each, each colony, and then put a blue background on because the skies in America are blue, right? And each white star for each state that was added to the Union. And then over time, the, the stars evolved in different configurations the 76 uh, Bennington flag, and then today, the flag that we have today. So that's, that's a brief history of the fort, who built it, why it's here, and it's why the museum is here. When the federal government turned over this land over to the city of New Bedford, the stipulation was we could have it, but we had to establish a museum about the fort and why it's here. And that's how we became. We've been in existence now about 11 years, 11, 12 years. And when we started out, we didn't have very much. We had the model, we had a couple of display cases and a handful of pictures. So as you see, when we walk around, the place is chock full of artifacts that people have had in their homes here in the city or in the surrounding area, didn't know what to do with this stuff. And when they heard about us, they brought it down. Everything in here is donated. The only thing we pay for is the picture frames, unless someone comes in with something with a picture frame that is antique or looks like it, it, it belongs with the picture, we'll leave it like that. But uh, the little, little black picture frames and that stuff that we have, we buy those. All that damage that we were looking at down in the gun rooms is caused by these plants. As these fortresses are getting older and crumbly, the uh, embrasure is actually damaging the fortress more. So in most places, they've been removed. One of the unique things about Fort Rodman is the fact that our second floor, Rodman or Totten embrasures, are all still in place. 
My recommendation here is that within 10, maybe 20 years, these will be the only ones left because as they damage the other buildings, people are simply removing them. I recommend that we restore them. We remove the rust, we put a preservative coating over them and keep those shutters because pretty soon, Fort Rodman will be the only place left that's got them. When it comes to defoliating the rooftop, you can't just get any old person to come out here and start yanking these plants out by the roots. The roots are deep into the masonry and into the granite and the bricks, and if you just start pulling them out, you'll cause additional damage to the rooftop. And since we're way up here, and everything below us is very damaged, we have to be careful not to damage it further and cause collapse below us. So we have to be very careful. Bring on somebody who is a specialist who is willing to slow down. I don't think there's a machine that I would accept up here to pull this stuff out. No, sir. You gotta do this by hand, and you gotta be very careful. It will be laborious and time-consuming, probably even expensive, but it's something that must be done, because any repair work that's done below the roof is only going to be undone by the continuation of the damage that you're looking at up here. Well, to those in battle who never came back, and what it, what it is, it's the Air Force and the Army, I know for sure, I'm not sure about the Navy and Marines, but they have what they call a dining in or a dining out. A dining in is when they take over the, the club on the base and they have a formal dinner. It's all catered. They have a guest speaker come in and talk to you about some subject, whatever it might be, choosing something from the military. They have this table set up and then off to the side they have two other tables with two punch bowls. One, both of them have uh, fruit punch in them. One is alcoholic, one is not. What they do is they, uh, they walk around, they inspect, your, inspect you in uniform, and if you've got anything wrong with your uniform, you have to go up and take a drink out of the, drink, out of the bowl. If you've got a speck of dust on your uniform, up to the bowl you go, right? They do that all night long. You might go to that bowl three or four times, you know? Your ribbons better be on straight, your insignia better be on straight, your uniform better be clean, no dust, no dandruff, no nothing, right? But this table is set up there alongside it, and this, everything on this table has a significance. The rose, the glasses, the lemon, the coffee cup, the silverware. You notice nothing is fancy, everything's plain. What it says here, this table set for one is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner along alone against his or her suppressors the tablecloth is white sim symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to the country's call of arms the single red rose in the vase signifies the blood that they may have shed in sacrifice to ensure the freedom of our beloved united states of america the rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrades who kept the faith while awaiting their return. The yellow ribbon on the vase represents the yellow ribbons worn on the lapels of thousands who demand with unyielding determination a proper accounting of our comrades who, who are not among us tonight. A slice of lemon on the, on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless fallen tears of families as they walk, wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us. Um, the chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope which lives in our hearts to eliminate their way home, away from the captors, to the open arms of the grateful nation. Most of it I can't take you inside of at all, because even when I was in there inspecting it, it was making me nervous. And if it's making me nervous, you should not go anywhere near it. Please, I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want my fortress to accidentally fall down. <laughs>